What do a horror film, a beloved sitcom, and a superhero movie all have in common? They all suffered from disastrous test screenings. From the bewildering to the outright unforgettable, these screenings ultimately killed the backbone of these films and TV shows. 2011's The Thing prequel, which followed up John Carpenter's 80s sci-fi horror classic, is a notorious case of a film being completely destroyed by the test screening process. If the number is high, there's a celebration. If the number is low when the preview cards stink, well, let's just say many people will suffer. The film was written by Eric Heiserer, who later earned an Oscar and BAFTA nominations for his script for Arrival. At this point in his career, Heiserer had only written Final Destination 5 and the 2010 A Nightmare on Elm Street remake. So he was under pressure to incorporate all of the major changes the studio imposed in the aftermath of negative test screenings for The Thing. After test screenings and reshoots, but before the movie went into wide release, Heiserer confessed that the poor response from test audiences led the studio to bring in the more experienced Scott Frank, writer of Minority Report and Get Shorty, for uncredited script doctoring. In an interview with Bloody Disgusting, Heiserer said, Right now, we get to the monster as fast as possible. Since the test screenings proved that's what those audiences wanted, I can't say yay or nay to it, but it does feel like there are pieces of it missing. The test screenings also affected the film's special effects. The Thing was originally shot with practical effects, just like Carpenter's original film. After test screenings, the studio opted to cover up the effects with CGI. Given that the NBC show Friends is one of the most popular and successful sitcoms ever made, it likely comes as a shock to learn it was extremely poorly received in its early test screenings. NBC engages in extensive research and testing for all of its new shows, and the test screenings of the Friends pilot were so disastrous, the show was nearly axed instead of getting a full season order. Traditionally, after test audiences view a pilot, the aggregated result of their reactions is boiled down to a score between 0 and 100. A series with successful prospects is expected to score upwards of 70. Friends earned a measly 41 out of 100. Hey! You could do a lot worse than Joey Tribbiani! One of the biggest issues mentioned by test audiences was that the cast of Friends didn't seem like friends. They were put off by the lack of caring, warmth, and chemistry between the main characters, who they considered to be largely unlikable. They didn't find the show funny or compelling and indicated that they wouldn't feel inclined to watch subsequent episodes. Fortunately, NBC didn't listen, and the series, which ran for 234 episodes, went on to become one of the highest-rated series ever. A Batgirl movie starring Leslie Grace, Michael Keaton, J.K. Simmons, and Brendan Fraser was supposed to be released in 2022, but it wound up getting permanently shelved instead. Despite big names, a $90 million budget, and plenty of hype around its release, Warner Brothers Discovery made the decision to pull the plug and cancel its release altogether. The official line was that the cancellation was part of a general realignment of the company's plans for the DC Universe and HBO Max. This vague explanation didn't ring true for most. Oh, you can trust me, bad girl. I'd sooner trust a snake with fangs at both ends. It was suggested that the real reason was a combination of poor test screening feedback and the financial benefit of using the movie as a tax write-off. The Town Podcast host Matthew Bellony offered some insight in a Batgirl-focused episode, saying, the studio was trying to figure out whether it felt like it deserved a theatrical release, and the consensus was absolutely not. It played like a TV pilot. The stakes were very small. The poor test screenings coupled with the underhanded tax benefit made scrapping the film an appealing alternative to a theatrical release, squandering all the time and energy spent by everyone who worked on the movie. A surreal sci-fi fantasy about the perils of dystopian bureaucracy, 1985's Brazil was directed by former Monty Python member Terry Gilliam, who had to fight the studio tooth and nail to preserve his directorial vision. My complication had a little complication. Universal president Sidney Scheinberg already had issues with Gilliam's ideal version of the film, and poor test screenings exacerbated the problem. Gilliam's original cut of the film was 142 minutes long. Scheinberg and test audiences agreed that was excessive. Universal wanted to cut the film to 94 minutes, removing more than a third of its total content. Test audiences didn't like the dark ending either, but Scheinberg didn't want Gilliam to shoot a new ending. 
preferring instead to lop off the ending sequence before the bleak reveal. When Gilliam refused, Universal's response was to not release the film in the US, though it was available in the UK via a different distributor. With the fate of his film in jeopardy, Gilliam publicly called out Universal. He also personally brought his cut in front of LA critics through private screenings. They loved it and gave Brazil multiple awards, putting pressure on Universal to release the film. In the end, Gilliam had to make some edits, but the final cut of the film was 132 minutes, significantly longer than the 94-minute studio version. Before Mulholland Drive became an Oscar-nominated and BAFTA-winning film, it was intended to be a television show. Filmmaker David Lynch had found major success with Twin Peaks, his first foray into television. The show became an international phenomenon, but it was decidedly outside of the realm of traditional TV and struggled in the ratings in its second season, before being canceled. Several years later, Mulholland Drive was Lynch's attempt to re-enter the world of television. He wrote and directed the pilot episode which was 90 minutes long just like his earlier Twin Peaks pilot. He brought the pilot to ABC, who had aired Twin Peaks, but the network turned down the show after a single test screening. No other networks were interested either, so Lynch nearly gave up on the project. You're broke. Yeah, I'm not broke. I know, but you're broke. Luckily, he came into contact with Elaine Sard and Canal Plus, who gave him the funding and the motivation to repurpose the open-ended pilot into a self-contained feature film. The film version of Mulholland Drive is now considered a masterpiece, but one can't help but wonder what the series could have been with all of the other characters and side plots it might have explored. The 2007 post-apocalyptic thriller I Am Legend was a massive box office success, bringing in well over half a billion dollars worldwide. Despite the undisputed financial win, the film had some major issues. One of its biggest failings was the direct result of poor test screenings. The original ending of 2007's I Am Legend was more faithful to the novel it was based on. Dr. Neville, played by Will Smith, comes to learn that the creatures he has been battling, known as Dark Seekers, are far more intelligent and sophisticated than he's given them credit for. They have their own society and aren't the malevolent mindless monsters he thought. In the end, Neville realizes he's the real monster in their eyes as they see him abducting and torturing them in his lab. The meaning of the title becomes clear in the closing moments. Neville is the legend the Dark Seekers fear. After test audiences reacted negatively to this ending, the studio panicked. I can fix this! I can save everybody! A new ending was designed to appease audiences, but it proved to be a miscalculation. The film's conclusion is unsatisfying, undercuts the movie's themes, and contradicts the entire point of the film and its source material, not to mention the title, as Neville no longer realizes he is the bad guy. Army of Darkness is the third film in director Sam Raimi's Evil Dead series, though you'd be forgiven for thinking it was a standalone film based on the way Universal marketed it. Raimi wanted to call it Medieval Dead, but the studio didn't want to be associated with the independently produced and extremely gory first two movies in the series. They wouldn't allow any permutation of Evil Dead in the title, even though the second film's final cliffhanger is vital to understanding the plot of Army of Darkness. Since the first two Evil Dead movies were made with such low budgets, Raimi retained complete creative control over them. When Universal ponied up a budget for Army of Darkness that was dozens of times larger, Raimi's creative control was significantly lessened and test screenings became an unavoidable part of the process. After the screenings, the film changed drastically. The biggest alteration was the ending. Raimi wanted to have Ash, played by Bruce Campbell, attempt to return from the past to the present, but make a boneheaded error that lands him in an apocalyptic future where he goes mad. This was an on-brand ending that suited the series, but test audiences considered it too bleak. You can make a movie called Army of Darkness, and the audience goes, that was a sad ending. We're like, what? This pushed Universal in a different direction. In the new ending, Ash makes it back to his present, where he has a fun and goofy action scene in S-Mart to close out the film. 28 Days Later is a 2002 horror film set 28 days into a zombie-like outbreak in London that has decimated the population. The film was directed by Danny Boyle and written by Alex Garland in his screenwriting debut. In Garland's original ending, the main character Jim, played by Killian Murphy, died and left Selena, played by Naomi Harris, and Hannah, played by Megan Burns, to survive on their own. Test audiences thought it too bleak, so a replacement was whipped up in which Jim survives and the three live a peaceful life out in the countryside, as the future begins to look more hopeful. This new up ending might sound fine in a vacuum, 
but it runs counter to the dark, realistic tone of the rest of the film, not to mention that it undercut some of the film's major themes. This was a story that needed a bleak ending, but test audiences said no. Seinfeld towers as one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time. Across its nine seasons, the show racked up 10 Emmy wins and an unbelievable 58 additional nominations. Today, the series ranks in the top 50 highest rated TV shows of all time and is fondly remembered, but the series almost failed to get off the ground. According to an article in TV Guide, audience research conducted by NBC stated, no segment of the audience was eager to watch the show again. No soup for you. The show was called boring, unfunny, and confusing. Even NBC executive Brandon Tartikoff thought the series was too New York and Jewish centric. Because of the terrible reception, the show premiered in the middle of the summer, usually a sign that the network had no interest in taking it any further. That's why the first season of Seinfeld consisted of just five episodes, whereas later seasons typically contain the standard 22 episodes. Despite its chances for success being hamstrung by its own network, the quality of the series shined through and the show managed to find its audience. With the deck stacked against it, Seinfeld proved its detractors wrong. Little Shop of Horrors is the 1986 film adaptation of the musical stage play of the same name, which was itself a reimagining of Roger Corman's ultra-low-budget horror comedy from 1960. But the studio Warner Brothers was initially unwilling to put out a film that received such a negative reaction with test audiences. The big issue was the ending, which had worked so well on the stage. Director Frank Oz told Entertainment Weekly that the test screening was going wonderfully at first, saying, there was applause. They loved it. It was just fantastic. However, the audience reaction soured instantly at the end of the film. The original ending had Seymour, played by Rick Moranis, get eaten and killed by the talking plant, Audrey too. She then grows to gigantic heights, rampages through New York City, and climbs to the top of the Statue of Liberty before busting through the screen, winning in the end while the heroes perish. Test audiences hated the ending. Oz explained, you have to have a 55% recommend to really be released, and we got a 13. Warner Brothers forced Oz to shoot a new, happier ending that let the heroes live. Under the threat of having the film go unreleased, Oz begrudgingly complied. Looking back, he said, We had to do it, and do it in such a manner that the audience would enjoy the movie. It was very dissatisfying. <laughs>